Welcome to All Things Beer, a Pat's Pints Mark's Mugs podcast. I'm Pat Woodward. And I'm Mark Richards. Each month, we are joined by brewers, enthusiasts, and friends to explore the techniques, the culture, and the history of mankind's best invention. So grab a beer and join us as we discover a world of all things beer. Right on. And we've got joining us today again, Hans Gorsuch. I'm here. Thanks for having me. Well, today we're going to take a little trip. I mean, we've been kind of cooped up. You've got the COVID, which makes international travel practically impossible. Even regional travel heavily discouraged. And I was just getting a little restless. So I thought, why don't we hop across the pond virtually and go to Belgium and uh, hit the Trappist Ale Trail? Now, Pat, I have been to Belgium, but I have never hit the Trappist Ale Trail. I've had some Trappist Ales while in Belgium, but not visited the brewery. And you visited a lot of these, am I correct? That is correct. They don't give you a book and you don't get stamps when you do this, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> but you can visit almost all of the Trappist breweries. Maybe not the brewery itself, but you know, nearby the cafe, see the environment. And that's what we're going to do today. We're going to focus even a little bit more down than that. And we are going to be in search of the quadruple, the quad, the Belgian dark strong, the strongest, most expressive of the Trappist beers. Well, I think it was a great decision to pick one style because that way we can do more. That's right. We can do this journey again. I mean, why blow the whole thing at once? Quads is a great thing to focus on. I'm ready to crack one already. But before we take a trip over to the Trappist monasteries, why don't we start by talking about what makes up a Trappist brewery? Well, first of all, let's talk about the Trappists. The Trappists are an order of monks, Catholic monks. Their official name would be the Order of Cistercians of the Strict Observance. I think there's about 100 to 200 Trappist monasteries around the world, but only a handful of them brew beer. Part of the reason why they brew beer is all of the Trappist monasteries follow the rule of St. Benedict. Hans, I think you're familiar with the rules of what it takes to be an authentic Trappist brewery. These monks, if they are being of the strict observance, the question is, what is that thing they are observing? And in this case, it's the rule of St. Benedict, and it's like a huge thing, 73 chapters long, that governs all aspects of the lives they live at these monasteries. There are general virtues like humility and silence and obedience, but then there are also like prescriptions for daily living, right? Like common prayer and meditative reading and physical labor. So under that physical labor part, these uh, monasteries need to be uh, self-sustaining, and part of that is financial. With the ones that choose to brew beer, um, because they sell other products too, but the ones that choose to brew beer, the beer must be produced within the walls of the monastery. It can be by the monks themselves or just under their supervision, the general business practices need to fall with inside the guidelines of the rules of St. Benedict in general, and the profits are used to support the monastery, and if they have even extra on top of that, they do either charitable work with that money, or they might send it to other monasteries that weren't maybe profitable that year. When I was a younger man, back into the mid-1990s, I think there were really only six Trappist breweries that were making beer. Over the last, say, 20 years, that number has grown to approximately double that. So it used to be all of the Trappist breweries were in the low countries. Now we have Trappist Brewery in Austria. There's one in Rome. There's a newer one in the Netherlands. There's one in Massachusetts. There's one in England. But today, we're just going to stick to the Trappist breweries that have been brewing beer since the 19th century. We are going to start our journey, oddly enough, not in Belgium, but in the Netherlands. The monastery is called Koningshoven, which means the king's stables. But the beer these days is called La Trappe. And we're going to start with a La Trappe quadruple. And this is one that's pretty easy to get around town here. This is pretty widely distributed, yeah. yeah. La Trappe was the first brewery to call their strongest beer quadruple or quad. 
And if you go to Europe, in fact, I think it's still the only one that's called a quad. So if you were in Belgium or the Netherlands or Germany and you said, give me a quadruple, I assume you'd get the spear, a la trap. Oh, yeah. Let's crack this one, Pat. Let's get after it. Hans, you ready for a beer? I am so ready. Oh, that pours nice. It's got a deep amber color. Yeah, it's more golden than a lot of the Belgian Dark Strongs. What do you think of the nose? Boozy. Yeah, it's got alcohol. It's not like fusel alcohol, but the alcohol is very evident. Get a lot of dark fruit and uh, kind of caramel notes, maybe from the malt, maybe from a little age. I'm kind of getting a little cherry in this too, along with uh, kind of raisin plum and also a touch of vanilla. For me, it's everything you just said, and there's like a candy character to it, mm-hmm. and maybe a tiny, tiny bit of banana, and maybe even almond, Like, but all mixed in there. Um, uh, difficult to kind of tease out these individual aromas. As many aromas as we've listed, it is all kind of like one thing in the glass. It's very together. It's very blended. The flavors are very well integrated. I mean, for me, I get much less of the dark fruit than I think we'll see with the later beers, but definitely the caramel. I get that vanilla note. I could see a little bit of dark fruit in there. There's definitely some underlying fruitiness to it, but as boozy as it smells and as strong as it is, this is a 10% beer, and as decadent as the taste is, it goes down pretty easy and it really, really does. Man, just get a lot of banana on that last sip. Yeah, and I guess that's going to come from the yeast. I think one of the things that we'll talk about today is these different breweries, first of all, they have different yeast strains, and secondly, they ferment by somewhat different strategies, especially with respect to the temperature. This monastery, I called it Koningshoven, which means the king's stables, and the reason why it's called that is it was established in about 1880, and the land that it was established on used to belong to the king of the Netherlands. Unlike the other Trappist breweries, for the longest time, the kind of beer they brewed at this monastery was lager. Hmm. So their first brewer, they sent him to Bavaria to learn how to brew. And so if you go to Bavaria and learn how to brew, they're going to teach you how to brew lagers. And so they brewed lagers up until, well, I think in the 1960s, they entered into a partnership with Artois, which has since morphed into what we would call AB InBev, right? And that was not a very good relationship. And I think within about 10 years, there was no brewing at all happening at the monastery. And so the monks just dissolved their relationship and then they started over from ground zero. Okay. Then they decided to start brewing ales. But if you go there, this is the only Trappist brewery that you can get a tour of. You can see the brewery. They don't still malt their own grains, but the malt house was built back in the 19th century. It's very cool. And they have a cafe right there on site that they operate. Lots of bike trails around there, so it would be a good place to bike to in the summer and uh, go to the cafe. They have uh, outdoor tables at the cafe there. The Dutch people in general, I find to be very practical, kind of welcoming without being overly friendly. I think that's a good way to describe this brewery. Now, did you dine at the cafe? I did indeed. Yeah, Yeah. took the tour? Yes, yes. So, I actually got a tour from their export manager. His name was Dieter, and I met him when I was in the UK. And he came over to the UK to do an event on La Trappe products. And actually, we're going to get to a beer I bought from Dieter when he came to Durham, uh, one of their special barrel-aged quads. Nice. Dieter said, if you come over sometime, I'll give you a tour. So, uh, Lorinda, my wife, and uh, my daughter Iris, we went there. We had lunch. Then we met Dieter, and he took us all around the place, showed us all of the brewery, and there's a bakery there, and there's a fire station, because it used to be that these monasteries were really basically self-contained communities. It was fantastic. That's awesome. Well, this beer is fantastic, too. I'm just loving it to the bottom of the glass here. Yeah, I think I did a lot of loving on mine. It's empty. (laughs) I'm ready to crack that Oak Age one. Yeah, let's try the Oak Age one. Okay, so let me say a little bit about this beer. Every year, La Trappe takes their quad and they age it in different barrels and then they blend it. And they use different combination of barrels every year. This year, 2017, they did a blend of Scotch whiskey and a virgin oak. 
So I think this is 71% aged in Brugladek, Port Charlotte, single malt whiskey barrels. Gesundheit. <laughs> oh man, so much peat smoke too. It just braces you as soon as you take a sip. You get your nose towards a glass and so much smoke. This could be a barbecue. This is a completely different beer. Well, that's why I wanted to drink the regular Lit Trap. The barrel aging here makes it into something entirely different. Yeah. It, it's got a, a tobacco thing, not just that smokiness. Absolutely. I could agree with that. It almost doesn't seem as sweet as the first one, and I don't know if that's some more of the complexity that's in there, but... Could be some of the tannins from the oak yeah. to add a little bitterness that counteracts the uh, sweetness. I could see that. Still pretty dry. It's not as clear. In the nose, I was thinking scotch is kind of overwhelming it, but in the taste, I like it quite a bit. A little overpowering, but once you acclimate yourself, it does get a little more rich, get a little more fig. The fig is a good call because I think that does come out. It does not smell or taste like any of the alcohol went away. That's for sure. Other than being covered up a little bit by the peat smoke. Yeah, I think if you're a whiskey lover, you would be very, very happy with this beer. And I'm not that big of a whiskey drinker, but I'm pretty happy with this beer. Well, so awesome that you shared it. This has been a little time too. what, Pat, probably two years since you received this bottle? Yeah, so I visited Belgium. This trip that we're sort of retracing today was uh, April 2018. So okay. Coming up on three years ago, this beer was put into a bottle probably three and a half years ago. Right on. And of course, these are beers that you can lay down and age for several years. I've got to tell you, I'm feeling a little warm already, Pat. Now, we're only sharing a few ounces of each of these, so this is not like we're having a bottle apiece, but got a little glow on over here. Well, our journey today is a serious one. We're going to encounter some beers that uh, deserve respect. A serious journey requires serious beers. <laughs> <laughs> Now, I see they've only been aging since 2009 in barrels. I think that's when they introduced this program. Mm -hmm. So these are fairly new, really. That's true. This is kind of a new program. And, and maybe at this point, I might say that also Chimay does barrel-aged versions of their Dark Strong. Okay. Those are the only two Trappist breweries I know of that do this. You know, it's kind of following the American model a little bit. I think in an earlier podcast, when we were all three talking about Saisons, we talked a little bit about the echo effect of what American brewers interpreting Belgian styles have since influenced people in Belgium. And I think right. this would be another example of that. For better or for worse. This is good. I'm not going to say it's better than the first, but it sure is unique to experience the same beer this way. Now, before we leave La Trappe, I should say that La Trappe has not always been called La Trappe the beers. What we're going to find when we go to the other breweries is that the name of the abbey is not what the beer is known by. They take the name of the nearby town. This abbey, as I mentioned before, is called Koenigshoven. And there was a point in time in the 90s up until the early 2000s when these beers were called Koenigshoven. I asked them when I was there, well, why don't you use the name of the nearby community? But the nearby community is called Berkel Inschott. <laughs> and they just said they didn't think that would roll off the tongue very well. <laughs> but in the early days, when it was still a lager brewery in the first 70 years of the 20th century, it was called Shepshui, which means the sheep's fold. So basically, the beer was named after a sheep barn. And the cafe there still has a thatched roof, and it's meant to be like a sheep barn, basically. Oh, cool. So that, that's kind of neat, I thought. Interesting. Are we going to make our way into Belgium here at some point? Yeah, I think it's time to get into Belgium. After all, that's the theme of it. And, How are uh, we getting there, Pat? Are we on bicycle now? Or are we in a car with someone else driving, I hope? Yeah, I think we're in a chauffeured Mini. Excellent. And uh, That's going to be a tight squeeze with the driver <laughs> and the three of us. <laughs> Two in the back seat and, and one person riding shotgun. That'll work out. Maybe we'll get Dieter to drive us around. <laughs> so we're going to have to jump on the motorway and head south past Antwerp. We could, if it was like my own journey in Belgium, take a little detour and head over to Vestmal. But uh, Vestmal doesn't make a quad. And so we're going to skip that. We're going to stay on task. We're going to go through Brussels. And we're not going to stop in Brussels either. Once we get past Brussels, we're going to head a little bit southeast 
and we're going to go into the Ardennes. How would I describe the geography of the Ardennes? Rolling hills, forested. Most of the towns in the Ardennes are less than 10,000 people. It's a really beautiful part of Belgium. It reminds me a little bit of southeast Ohio. You know, if you head down to Athens, you get into forested country, rolling hills. You've got rivers carving through the hills. And we are headed to Rochefort next. Okay. Now, Hans, this is unprecedented that Pat wouldn't be trying to squeeze in a couple more stops. Am I right? That is his tendency, but we've got a clear agenda here, and we've got some great, great places to head to. Well, this beer you see around town, like if you're shopping for beers, this is one that I often see on the shelf. That's right. Always in a single, isn't it? Always. This is Rochefort 10. Rochefort, actually the abbey is called Abbey Notre Dame Saint Remy, and it is the only one of the Trappist monasteries that I know of that has no cafe or nearby inn. So you really can't visit Rochefort. Okay. Fortunately, all of the towns in the Ardennes have Rochefort around. So when I went there, we stayed in a town not too far away called La Roche in Ardennes. And we went to a pizza place, and that was the beer they had on the menu. They had the three different Rochefort's and pizza. And how was the pizza there? Very good. Very good. The Belgians are uh, wonderful people. They make great beer, and they cook great food. And there's a lot to be said for a culture that does both of those things. So this poured like mahogany. Well, not a super thick head, a substantial head, a dense head on this. It seems to be staying on. I mean, it's fairly well carbonated. I did note that they've been brewing this since 1952, Pat. That sounds about right. I think in Rochefort, they have been brewing beer since uh, around 1900. But I know uh, they've changed things over the years. They've changed the recipes a little bit. At one point, I think the monks from Chimay came out and gave them some advice to help improve their beers. But yeah, that sounds right, that this beer dates back to mid-20th century. You don't get any of the alcohol note, not in the way um, we did in the previous beer. It smells so good. But there's also some, it's not like Bretomyces, but something that comes from somewhere different, like hay or something a little more musty and interesting on the back end of the aroma in this one for me. Hmm. I'm getting cherries again on this one, I'm going to have to say. Figs and cherries. Uh, It's a little nutty as well, like in some chocolate, so a little darker malt, and that's obviously evident from the color change from what we were having earlier. The La Trappe was amber, right? But I think we're going to see that all of the beers going forward are going to be a bit darker than that. A bit richer in color. But interestingly, the monks don't necessarily use a lot of dark malts in these beers. So I think some of them do use a little bit of Munich malt, but they're not using, as a rule, caramel malts and crystal malts. So that dark color comes from the sugar that they use. Okay, cool. So this would have Belgian hard candy in it, right? Some kind of caramelized dark Belgian sugar. Yeah. Yeah, Excellent. I've never read anything that says this is exactly what they use. They're kind of coy about that. We've both got Belgian candy sugar before to put in beers from, say, a homebrew supply. The first time you see that candy and think, well, this isn't like a candy that you would just throw in your mouth and eat. So it is a candied sugar, but I don't think this is like the candy of Belgians. No, I don't think there is <laughs> walking around like a, with a bag of sugar throwing uh, crystals into their mouth. Yeah. You know, the more I smell this, I get a lot of kind of citrusy Something in like the lemon, lemon orange vein on the nose. Well, you're picking up something very interesting because this is the only one of the beers we're going to have today where it is known that they use a little bit of spice. And the spice that they use in this beer is coriander. Okay. And I wonder if you might get just a little bit of that coriander. That can give a citrusy flavor. Yeah, it does. It has a little note of citrus. So this is 10. Why is this beer Rochefort 10? It's 11 and some change in ABV. Well, the 10 comes from the old Belgian 
gravity system, which isn't much used anymore, although it's easy to understand for anybody who's a home brewer. When you make the wort, before you start the fermentation, right, we would call that the original gravity, and you'd measure the density of the wort and compare it to water. So 10 means that the gravity of the wort was 1.010. So the, the original gravity would be 10, and that's why they call it Roche for 10. Yeah, that's unintuitive to somebody who's not tuned in to taking specific gravities of wort and finished beer and, and all of that. Things that seem obvious when you're there doing it, but not at all if you aren't doing that kind of thing every day. Yeah, I don't think it's very intuitive unless you're a brewer what that means. The simple thing is the bigger the number, the stronger the beer. You can remember that. It also tells you something about the attenuation of these beers that you start with a gravity of 1010 and you end up with an 11% beer. If you look in Stan Hieronymus's book, Brew Like a Monk, which if for anyone who's interested in these beers is really an excellent resource, he talks about most of the beers, the original gravity, the final gravity, and the percent attenuation. And all of these are between about 82% to 89% attenuated. Oh. So the attenuation on these big, dark Belgian quads is like a Saison. It's so interesting because... I wouldn't have guessed that necessarily from perception of, of these tastes we've had so far. So that's that's surprising to me. And that comes back to the sugar again. You know, using that sugar helps it to be more attenuated. You know, many years ago, uh, in the kind of early days of my blog, we did a whole 15 beer, four round blind taste test of quads. And, and that's because you're blind by the time you're done tasting all those things? <laughs> well, well, that's, that's why, we, why we call it blind tasting, right? We weren't blind, but we had a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, we didn't do it all in one night. One of the things was every single person practically could tell the difference between the Belgian ones and the American ones. And the main difference was that the Belgian ones are a little drier, they're more attenuated, and that's because the Belgian brewers use sugar in a way that a lot of American brewers are a little gun-shy to use sugar that amount. I, I think it's their willingness to increase fermentation temperatures as well. Those American brewers might be using the same yeast, but I just think those Belgian yeasts of those styles, they'll just eat all the way to the bottom if you let them. If you give them the, the time and the temp to do it, like they're just beasts in that way. Well, I'm glad you brought that up, Hans, and this is something we've discussed a lot. We discussed it at length on the Cezanne podcast. Uh, but I did go into Hieronymus's book, and he has some figures for what the standard practice is at these breweries. And at Rochefort, interestingly, they pitch at 68, and they never let the temperature go above 73. That's surprising. And, and yet highly attenuated. And yet highly attenuated. Now, another good book on the Trappist is a book called Trappist Beer Travels. Uh, this was released a few years ago. It's written by Carolyn Wallace, Sarah Wood, and Jessica Deal. But when they were visiting Rochefort and the brewer was showing them around and they opened up, they said, a fairly young bottle of the Rochefort 10 and tasted it. And the way they described it was like figs soaked in alcohol. And the brewer was very happy with that. He said, yes, it should taste like figs, not bananas. We do not want banana flavor in our beers. Oh, interesting. Before we leave Rochefort, though, I mean, I, I would just like to tell people that if you get a chance to visit the Ardennes, it's really a beautiful place. And there's a lot of interesting things there. You know, we're going to only make one stop in the Ardennes. But if we were not on the Quad Trail, we could go down to the very far southeast tip of the country and go to Orval, which I highly recommend. But we've got a whole podcast on Orval, do we not? That's right. You could listen back on that one. It's worthy of a full podcast. Too. Absolutely. One of the best beers in the world. You could continue to go east toward Germany, and you could go to Aschuf, which is another uh, excellent brewery. And also, one of the things the Ardennes is particularly well known for is there was a really famous campaign that was fought there during World War II, and that's called the Battle of the Bulge. And the whole premise of that was the Allies felt that the Germans would not come through the Ardennes because it was they felt impassable to tanks and motorized combat. But since that was the least well-defended area, that's where the Germans decided to come through. And so it was during the winter, and it was a couple months long. But there's really an excellent museum in Bastogne about the Battle of the Bulge. If you're traveling, and you have a little extra time between your beers, that's worth a stop. Awesome. The next beer we're going to drink, right, might be the 
most famous of Belgian beers if somebody isn't into that sort of thing. It's a very well-known name, yeah? Dieter? Let's make for Chimay. So now we are going to go a little bit south and west. We're going to leave the Ardennes, and we're going to cross over into Hainaut, which is the province where Cezans are from. We're still in Valonia. We haven't talked about the flanders valonia divide yet on this show, but we're still in the French-speaking part of Belgium. And in fact, Chimay is a short walk to the French border. If you go through the town of Chimay, one of the roundabouts has an old Chimay copper boil kettle in the center of the roundabout. Ah, cool. The monastery and the brewery are a bit of a drive. I think it's about 15 minutes out of the town south toward the French border. We're not going to go to the abbey itself. The abbey is not called Chimay. That's the town. The abbey is called Abbey de Scormont. There's an inn nearby. They have a restaurant they have a little bit of a bar, and, and they also have rooms. You can stay there. And there's also a little museum within the And then there's a pretty extensive range of Chimay beers you can buy for takeaway at the inn. So, I don't know about you guys, but Chimay would have been, for sure, the first Trappist beer I ever had. This goes back to early 1990s. Definitely mm-hmm. for me. Chimay does have a lower strength beer at about 4.6%. They call Dory, okay. which, is, which is basically a wit beer. Yeah, uh, but let's not talk about that one. Then they have three beers like most of the other places we're going here. So you could identify them by the color of the caps, and that's red, white, blue in terms of increasing mm-hmm. strength. Um, they do all have names. I think the red one is called Premier. Premier, yep. And that's a double. And the white one is called Sink Sense. Sink Sense. Mm-hmm. Five Cents. And that's a triple. And then the one we're drinking now, the blue is called the Grand Reserve. And this was initially Beer de Noël. So they mm-hmm. brewed this for Christmas time back in the 1950s, and it was so popular that they decided to make it uh, part of the year-round lineup. And these are all readily available. You'll see these on the shelves all the time. And man, I stick my nose in this glass, and my brain just says, Chimay. To me, it just has to be the yeast character. I think different than many other breweries, like they go to great, great lengths in identifying and maintaining their yeast strain down to having monks whose full-time job is looking in a microscope at the yeast and making sure they keep and maintain the same strain. Yeah, it's one of the most iconic yeasts in the brewing world, probably. And expressive. Like I just think when I stick my nose in the glass, you know, we talk about these other beers we've tasted, and, and where these aromas might have come from, right? Some has to do with the, the malts. Some that we've had um, have to do with the barrel it was aged in. But to me, it's just the best expression of this yeast you get when you smell and taste these chimes. I find that of all that we've had so far, this one is a little bit brighter to me. And it almost has like a pear note to it like a fruity character that is not of the rich, dark fruits that we were having. Although there's still a little underlying fig and maybe a little a breadiness, maybe. I would say on this one especially, there's a brighter character in there that's something in the esters. And I think part of what contributes to that is, and again, this might just be perception, because Pat, you were just saying, these beers are actually all very well attenuated, even though my experience of them is to start, that there's some residual sweetness left in the, the previous beers we tasted. To my taste, this finish is drier than the previous beers we've tasted. Well, it should be said that this one is not quite as strong. So we've been up in the 10, 11, 12% category, and now we're at a mere 9% ABV Ooh, on this we're one. We're slacking a little bit. This is, this is like a monk session beer. That's right. No, monk session beers are called singles. That's called an ankle. <laughs> That's true. The monks right. at Chimay don't drink this for breakfast, really. It's a quad session beer. I was reading in one of these books about, and I don't remember which monastery, but there was one monk who liked to take some of the strongest beer for the 11 o'clock meal. I might point out that the monks start the day around 4 a.m. with prayers. And I think there's six or seven different prayer sessions during the day. So, you know, 11 a.m. is probably the middle of the day if you're a monk. 
I think it would make me more spiritual. Yeah, yeah. Spirits, <laughs> spirits is uh, <laughs> definitely what I would say. Separate from the attenuation, uh, I also just think this finishes cleaner than the previous spirits we've had. I would agree. Yeah, it's brighter all the way around. Well, I also think they let the fermentation temperature go higher. So I think part of that pear, I don't get a lot of banana, but maybe it's a background note here. I think you are getting more yeast esters in this beer than we got from either the La Trappe or the Rochefort. Yeah, I get no banana here. Hey, a little, I know Hans mentioned on one of the other beers, tobacco, maybe just a slight touch of tobacco. And I think the higher alcohol beers, there's something in them that helps disperse those aromas and helps you perceive those aromas. So sometimes a thing might have stuff in it, but your perception of it is different because of the circumstances, right? Like a beer that's served way too cold. It might have lots of interesting aromas and flavors, and you can't perceive them just because it's too cold. So one thing is, how do you get those chemicals into the beer? The other is, what things affect your perception of them once they're in there? And for me, I think alcohol content in a beer affects that. Well, the alcohol can help solubilize things that might not be so soluble in water. And then let's not discount the carbonation levels of these beers, which tend to be high. We got to jump in our car, and uh, Dieter is going to take us from Hainaut to West Flanders. So we're going to drive along the Belgian-French border, almost all the way to the ocean. Along the way, you pass through a city called Ypres, and this is really the height of trench warfare during World War I. So watch out for the potholes? Watch out for unexploded ordinances and potholes. Uh, yeah, you know, that's a whole other thing, but very interesting if you've got the time to take it in. You're on smaller and smaller roads, Pretty soon, you're like on a road that's not wide enough for two cars to go by. And when I was going there, actually there was a tractor coming down the road at one point in time. I had to pull off as far as I could to the side and let the tractor go by. This part of Belgium is very green. It's very flat. We're back now in Flanders, right? So now the people speak Dutch. And eventually you come to this collection of buildings, which is the monastery. Uh, this is Abbey. St. Sixtus. And then across the road, there is a cafe, the Invred Cafe. Your options when you get there, if you've called up ahead of time and made a reservation, you can get in the drive through line where you drive through like, I don't know, it's kind of like a restaurant. You drive through a little enclosed area with a roof over it. And the monks put a case of beer in your trunk if you've already paid for it. It's really kind of like COVID times, but the monks were way ahead of themselves when it came to this. It's I, part of the reason some places started making beer, because beer was safer during some pandemics. Yeah, absolutely. Beer was always safer than water if you go back far enough in time. I'm feeling pretty safe right now. So now I'm going to open a bottle of beer with absolutely no label on it whatsoever. I am so very excited to taste this super rare beer. The Westy 12. I don't think I've ever had one in my life, to be honest with you. I mean, it's possible one was brought to a tasting where I'll admit I don't remember every beer I've ever drank, but I'm not so sure I've ever had one. I think you'd remember this one if you'd had it. Cheers. Cheers. Salud. Cheers. Visually, this is brown, not particularly clear. It pours with a little bit of head that kind of dies off to a scrim pretty quickly. No alcohol in the nose, as far as I'm getting. I would say mouthfeel-wise, this probably is the most like kind of creamy smooth. It's got a fuller mouthfeel. Still dry. I mean, that's weird that a beer would be so dry with such a full, creamy mouthfeel. And everything for this beer compared to some of the others we've had in this tasting, dialed back and dialed in and blended to me. It's lively and bright like the Chimay, but yet it carries more punch. I mean, it, it's just more substantial. Mm -hmm. It's um, got more malt body to the finish absolutely. Yeah, than does the Chimay. You know, if you were to talk about the Rochefort and the La Trappe, those are 
Yeah, those are beautiful beers, rich beers. But this one has... I think it's more mature and more elegant, like if we needed adjectives. Mm -hmm. So two things that are, let's say, different about the fermentation at West Vlederen versus Rochefort. One, they both pitch in the upper 60s. But at Rochefort, they don't let it rise above 73, whereas at West Vlederen, they let it go up to 82, 83 degrees. And the other thing that's different about West Vlederen, and I think it's the only remaining Trappist brewery that has open fermenters. So they have open fermenters, so oh, they don't like build up that, that uh, column of CO2 over it that you would get in you know standard breweries. I think that comes through in some of the characteristics you get in this beer that makes it a little bit more fruity expressive. I would say one more thing about the yeast. West Vlederen uses the Vestmal yeast. And so on brewing days, somebody drives up to Antwerp. Oh, I gets love, a this pitch story. Of love this story. Love this story. Well, I don't know if they do it the day, they probably do it the day before, but they drive up to Antwerp, get a pitch of the Vestmal yeast, and then they drive back down and they brew with it. That's awesome. Now, Pat, how long have you had this bottle? I mean, the two and a half years since you've been back, right? Okay, let's talk about how I came to be in possession of this I bottle. I really want to actually know this story because people might not be aware. It's impossible to get this beer. And so the opportunity for me even to taste one, I super appreciate. First of all, unlike Chimay and La Trappe, and even to some extent Rochefort, here the monks are really involved in the brewing. And so from what I've read, there's a layman, you know, a non-monk partner of every monk. Because the monks have to go pray seven times a day. And sometimes you might be mashing out, and maybe it would be inconvenient just to leave the beer and go pray. Now, come on. You could pray and mash at the same time. I mean, there's not a lot going on once the grain struck water. Well, It's a waiting game anyway. Can't you just stand there and pray? You obviously haven't read the full 73 chapters of the Rules of St. Benedict. Okay, I'm sorry. They're extensive. Anyway, the point being that the monks really do more than just oversee the brewing here. They're really involved in the brewing. You know, their point is they do not want to make beer to sell all over the, the world. You know, you mentioned at the beginning, there's no label, there's no marketing. I love this. How do you get this beer? How well, did you get this beer? Let me first say how you would normally get it, and then I'll say how I got it. So the normal way that you would obtain a Westie 12 would be you have to call the brewery, and somebody has to answer the phone. Many years ago, decades ago, you had a reasonable chance of getting a hold of somebody. And then after a few years of rate beer becoming a site, this beer became the highest rated beer in the whole world. At that point, as you can imagine, demand went through the roof. But the monks are not really interested in making a lot more beer, making more money or anything. So they just kept making the same amount. So you have to call. Basically, a monk has to pick up the phone. There's one monk. That's his job. He answers the phone. Or his doppelganger's job, because apparently each one has a layman who does his job when he's praying. That's a good point. I don't know if the phone answering monk has somebody who picks up his duties when he's not there. Also, by the way, the quantity in which you buy it is a case. I had to leave on an airplane fitting a case of this into my baggage. Would not have been easy, uh, especially because I made a lot of other stops. That just means you need to drink most of it before you get on the airplane. That... <laughs> <laughs> well, that is true, but you know we are talking, you know, an eleven percent beer, uh, and mm -hmm. I and I only went there two days before I left the country. So, what my strategy was is there's a cafe across the way, and you should be able to drink the beer with your meal in the cafe. And then uh, sometimes they would also have bottles on sale in the cafe. And so I thought I'll just see if they have something there. Well, I don't know. I got there. I drove all the way to the far southwest corner of. Belgium, practically to France, and, you know, the people who ran the cafe had taken Easter break for two weeks, so it was closed. No beer for me. I talked to some people who had driven from Berlin who were um, waiting in line. Whoa, they, had called yeah. them. they were USGIs, I think, actually. So there was a whole line of people waiting to go through and get their case of beer, but I couldn't get any. Now, how did I come by this bottle? Earlier in the trip, when I was in Brussels... If you go to Brussels and probably the other major cities in Belgium, you can find bottles of Westie 12 for sale in the beer shop. So I went to a beer shop. It was a pretty good beer shop. And I bought a few beers. And I said, well, I think I'm going to buy one of these just as an insurance policy in case when I go to the brewery, I strike out. Well done. And that was a good decision. Now, the monks don't like that. 
They don't want it to be sold on the black market. I guess for this beer, I probably paid 11 euros. Now, wait a minute. The black market. I mean, you got this at a beer store. No, but the, the mon- monks sell direct to consumer. The monks so a consumer only. had put this for sale in a store? Maybe somebody who worked for the store called up and got an appointment and went down and bought a case. Okay. And so it's basically resold in different places. It's similar to one of our local beer stores going and buying Hop Slam at another local beer store and then retailing it at their own store. I've never heard that story. It's, it's kind of like that, but not exactly. <laughs> It's awesome that you did that extra effort and ended up with this bottle. Like, that's a spectacular achievement, really. The other interesting thing, I was reading a quote last night when I was getting ready for the podcast. The monk who's in charge of brewing, he said, if we put a label on the beer, the label would say, do not import to the United States. And you broke the cardinal rule there. Well, I guess I did. You know, although I didn't, I'm not reselling it, am I? That's a good point. Well, I'm sold. It's pretty good. (laughs) Let's talk about this beer. It's kind of uh, similar to a lot of the flavors and aromas we've had so far, but it is noteworthy. I think a very interesting aged tobacco, got a little leather. It's very together with dark fruit, raisins. It's got a little caramel sweetness. It's got a warming alcohol, maybe not as warming as earlier, but I think mostly because we've had a few beers at this point that are pretty high ABV, so... It is possible that that's dialed back a bit, but I'm sure if this was our first beer, the alcohol would be more notable. I'm glad you said leather, because that's totally in there, and I wouldn't have had the vocab to get that out. Like, that's a good description. In a good way. Oh, totally. I think this is a beer that a little bit of age is a good thing for it. And this beer, I'm going to guess, is about four years old. And I'm going to guess it's about 10% alcohol. With no label, it's hard to answer any of these questions about how old it is, what its ABV is, or anything like that. There's now, something I like about monastic brewing, whether it's Trappist or not. I, I think because in the monastic environment, you are more sheltered from the whims and fads that go on in the rest of the world it lets you keep a certain kind of focus and not get diverted by things that are fleeting and not classic in the always still valued way. I do think the Trappist breweries that are on the smaller side have all kept a very focused portfolio of beers. Uh, They don't change them. I'm wearing a Cantillon shirt today because you know what? You don't find a lot of merch when you go to a Trappist cafe or brewery. You can find the glass, the goblet, but that's about it. And uh, yeah, there's something to be said for just saying, this is what we do, and we want to do it in the best possible way, and we we want to keep with the tradition if we can. And, you know, that's kind of a rare thing in the commercial world. Well, this is a lifetime beer tasting. Like, you know, being able to taste this beer is spectacular. And every beer we've had so far has been Trappist. I understand not everybody can go to West Flanders and queue up and get a case of the Westie 12. So we're going to have a much more accessible beer, which is the St. Bernardus ABT 12. The connection between St. Bernardus and West Veteran is very close because after World War II, West Veteran stopped brewing until the 1990s. And during that time, they licensed their beer to be brewed by... St. Bernardus. They gave their yeast to St. Bernardus. They gave the recipes. St. Bernardus made the West Veteran beer for 50 years. And then the monks decided, okay, we're going to start brewing again. And so that relationship was dissolved. But you know what? The beer that St. Bernardus makes is apparently made with the original West Veteran yeast oh, and nice. the original West Veteran recipe. So now we're going to taste, in theory, what West Veteran would have tasted like in 1930. Oh, that's awesome. Well, let's crack one now. Let's do it. Here you are, sir. Thank you. So, St. Bernardus 12, so far the most subtle of the things we've tasted, in my opinion. I don't want to use the word light, but it's a little lighter on the palate, for sure. 
the least complex of what we've had, maybe. Like, there's less going on. I get like, and Hans, you might dig this. I'm, I'm getting a little honey note on the aroma. I mean, there I, is I a little. I agree yeah, with that. Kind of like a honey and, and almost like a pastry like breadiness to it. It's a little roast in there where it's in the caramel, the chocolate vein. I think the body's a little lighter than what we've had so far, other than maybe the Chimay. Definitely dialed back, notably less carbonated, too. That's part of what makes mm-hmm. it more subtle and dialed back. Now, it could also be that we've now arrived on our sixth beer. No, I don't think so. I think you're accurate. I think you're totally honest. not tasting as strong as it was before, but... This is just more reserved in all of its expressions compared to the beers we've had previously. And that's not a dig on it. Um, it's It's super enjoyable. Yeah, I would agree. It is closer to the Chimay, I would say, than to the Westy 12. Yeah. I'm just kind of curious, what is the ABV on this one? ABV on this is 10%. There's also a notable saltiness to this beer Ooh, that some of the others did not I'm glad have. you just said that, and maybe... And I don't know if that's from the water they use. Uh, it could be additions to the water. There is a salty note to this that I don't think we experienced in any of the other beers Except for maybe lightly in the Chimay. I'm really glad you just said that. I couldn't put words to what it was. And it might not just only be saltiness, but the tiniest bit of soy or umami tied up in that saltiness. I could see that. After I went to West Lettering and I got there and I couldn't buy any beer and the cafe wasn't open, so I couldn't have a meal, uh, which was, I'm going to say, disappointing. What did I do next? I went to, there's a town called Poperinge, which is nearby, and they have a hop museum because it's the center of Belgian hop growing country. Okay. And what is in a hop museum? Uh, <laughs> well, hops. Uh, Obvious. I mean, maybe. Very old hops. Well, there was a lot All of right. stuff. Th- there was a lot of stuff about how they used to harvest the hops in the old days. So, like some old machinery and stuff? Yeah, they had things like machinery that they would spray sulfur onto the hops as an insecticide. In Belgium, they have this tradition after the hop harvest, they make some kind of scarecrow and then they burn it. That and seems so they reasonable. They had a model kind of scarecrow <laughs> thing. And who, who wouldn't do that? <laughs> yeah, of course. And then they had, uh, you know, different varieties of hops. And then there was a little display where they had a bottle of, at least they claimed, every kind of beer made in Belgium. I would say the only time I experienced anything close to a hop museum might have very well been in the upper floors of Cantillon, where they age the hops (laughs) until there's nothing left of them to add, which is really unique and also noteworthy to say that of all of the quads that we had, I don't think any of us once used the word hops. I'm sure there's some hops in here for a little bittering and balance, but a lot of it, I think, is coming from the phenolics from the yeast. So to complete our geography lesson and to prepare us for the next beer we're going to taste, tell us about the Clintonville region of Belgium. (laughs) It might be a bit of a stretch to say there's rivers cutting through it, but there are some creeks that cut through the Clintonville region. And in fact, I live on one of the cliffs in Clintonville that with a creek at the bottom, which is practically like the Meuse River cutting through the Ardennes near Dinant, where the saxophone was invented. And, and you know, oddly enough, I live on the next creek south of that, <laughs> and it was turned into a road, and that's no shit. Really? Torrance? Yeah. yeah. I guess that's why it's called Torrance. That's exactly Because there yeah. used to be torrents of water coming down. In, in modern times, there are still torrents of water coming down the street. <laughs> that is the region in which the next home-brewed beer we're going to drink was brewed. So now we're off the map. We are no longer in Belgium. We're not even Belgium adjacent. We're in Clintonville pouring... A home-brewed Belgian Dark Strong. How's it look in the glass? It's got the right color, I'd say. Very dark amber. I don't know. How would you guys describe it? I think it's a little lighter than the mahogany beer we drank earlier. I think it's slightly more carbonated maybe than some others we've had. Yeah, I think we've gone for a little bit higher carbonation here. It's not bright. It's not hazy. Somewhere in the middle. Man, in the nose, though... It is living in the geography of these previous beers when you stick your nose in that glass. 
This is a collaboration between Hans and myself and our friend Chris Mercer Hill. The goal of what we're trying to do here is to make a quad, or Belgian Dark Strong, but to make it in, I'm going to uh, sound a little bit highfalutin here, but to make it with a little bit of North American terroir. Pat, what's the name of this beer? Noir, Noir, Noel. It's kind of a tongue twister, but the first two words mean black walnut in French. And then the last word, of course, means Christmas. So this is our beer de Noel, and we make it with black walnuts that Hans and I and Chris forage. A lot of it comes from the ravine behind my house, where the mighty Overbrook River cuts through the limestone of Clintonville, if you will. Um, What do you guys think about the taste? Is it anywhere close in league with what we've been drinking? I think the walnuts really come through. They do. And black walnuts have such a distinct aroma and flavor, even compared to English walnuts. Yeah, indeed. I mean, I get it immediately. I would not say it's overpowering, though, but it's like the smell of that. And then once you start sipping in, you're getting a lot of those characters that we were getting in the beers we tasted before this. I like the spritziness of the carbonation on the front end, on the tip of my tongue. I like the finish. Like Once you swallow and the beer is out of your mouth, there's some residual maltiness left there, a little black walnut um, left on your tongue. It's an experience from the moment you sip it to the moment you swallow it. I, I like it. We've also gone New World with the sugars here, and we have refined this a little bit over the three falls in a row, or three Christmases in a row, I should say, that we've brewed this. So part of your inspiration for this beer to begin with was around the notion that, okay, this is a Belgian style, and adding sugars is part of that process, and molasses was a flavor around which this recipe was originally designed. The first time around was, I think, half molasses and half honey. I mean, molasses has a lot of unrefined sugar flavors in it that the yeast are not going to break down. It's got a mineral quality to it. Mm -hmm. We've got a pound and a half of sugar in this recipe, which is, I think, coming close to about 8 to 10% of the malt bill. And the first year we did half molasses, half honey that you had, Hans. And we've refined that, and now what we've got is about one-third molasses, one-third buckwheat honey, which is a very dark honey, and then one-third a South American unrefined cane sugar that you can find in the Mexican grocery stores. Uh, It's either called panela or pilanchillo. In general, if you just put sugar in, it doesn't have any flavor impact. It lightens the beer, it boosts the ABV, but it doesn't leave any flavor. So here we want unrefined sugar that has the kind of longer chain sugars that the yeast can't break down. So it contributes to the flavor in the spirit of the Belgian quads. What do you get, Mark, when you stick your nose in that glass? There's not as many fruits, if that makes sense, like kind of a plum, kind of a prune. And this is a pretty young beer, too, all things said, for the weight. So I'd be curious what this is like with a little bit of age in the bottle. It's very good, though. Extremely approachable. And like I said, not that the black walnut is overwhelming, but it is very prevalent. Interestingly, this might be the lightest in color beer we've had tonight. Pat, what malts are in this beer? Yeah, this is about 70% Pilsner. And then I think on the order of about 10% Dark Munich. Maybe about 4% of this Belgian caramel malt. It's really a very intense kind of raisiny caramel malt called Special B. And and I would say that most American breweries who make quads or doubles use some Special B because it, it gives that dark fruit character. And then, you know, there's a little bit of wheat and carapils for head retention. And then the rest of it, uh, like I said, close to 10% are these dark sugars. So what kind of yeast did you use in this? The yeast that's used on this is the Omega Belgian A, which is supposed to be close to the Ashouf yeast. Okay. Nice, nice. Well, I mean, it finishes kind of clean, actually. It for does finish clean. How much nuttiness is in the front? But e- even after I swallow and I sit here for a minute, I still have like this black walnut character left on my tongue, and not in a bitter, astringent way, in like... And like, oh, that's a very interesting flavor you don't find in other places ever. And so you said terroir earlier. 
these black walnuts grow natively in Ohio. These aren't um, cultivated trees that people have planted. These are just things that grow in our forests. And so you in your backyard and me walking around in other woods that are, uh, you know, around the neighborhood, we just collected these nuts, right? And yep. you processed them. And then we sat and, you know, cracked and picked these nuts. And you did maybe something a little different with how you added the nuts to this version of the beer and maybe how much. The first two iterations of this beer, we used, you know, on the order of about five ounces of walnuts that we added, maybe the last 10 minutes of boiling. So we wanted to get it in the boil. I mean, the flavors of nuts are not that easy to draw out. So we did that this time. But then on top of that, I did, well, this is a PG rated podcast, but I, we, we did a dry nutting where we um, <laughs> put about five ounces of uh, walnuts in the dry hop, sort of basically into the secondary. And I, I think that does give a little bit more walnut flavor. And then how long in the secondary before bottling those nuts? Yeah, I'd have to look back at the notes, but, you know, it was probably two or three weeks in the secondary. Yeah. So that worked. I'm just saying, like, you totally get that in this beer. It's not overwhelming. It's pleasant, and it's utterly unique. Part of the inspiration of black walnuts in a beer actually came from another local beer that has black walnuts. Well, I think all three of us are big fans of The Oil of Aphrodite by Jackie O's uh, Black Walnut uh, Imperial Stout. It's a spectacular beer. Other local brewers that might do a quad? Oh, I'm glad you asked that question. There's not a lot of brewers that do a quad, but I do... Absolutely, before we finish this podcast, I want to give a shout out to Stoss Brewing in Delaware, Ohio. And uh, they make a quad called The Evangelist. And uh, for those of you who know Don and Liz at Stoss, so Liz's dad, his name is Tony Evangelista. That's where the name comes from, because as Liz told me, she took the inspiration for that beer from her father. That's a beautiful beer, too. So for commercially available... Beers in the style, you don't have to go to Belgium. You do not. We've got a good part of a 750 milliliter bottle of this homebrew to finish, although we might have finished the podcast before we finished this bottle. Yeah, and I've got to say, for the special ingredient to be black walnut, could not be more accurately captured than in this beer. Well, thank you. Well... It's probably time to go, guys. I have enjoyed this afternoon immensely. Yeah. We just mowed through seven pretty high ABV beers, and I think you're right, Pat. It might be time to close it out. Hans, thanks for joining us again. Thank you. Loved it. And listeners, thanks for listening. Take care out there. Be safe. Absolutely. Get out there and rate our podcast. Give us a little uh, bump on iTunes or however you listen to this. Throw a review out there. Cheers. Cheers.